On April 11, 2025, in Boca Raton, Florida, a Cessna 310R with the tail number November 8930, November went down just after takeoff, killing three members of the Stark family and injuring someone on the ground. And here's the really crazy part. Just minutes before impact, the pilot's final radio call was, we can only make left turns. Now, the NTSB preliminary report is out, and while it doesn't give us the final answers, it does give us a lot of fascinating clues to analyze. The flight itself was supposed to be straightforward, Boca Raton to Tallahassee, but it was also the first flight right after the airplane had finished its annual inspection, which is always a sensitive moment in aviation. On the surface, everything looked perfectly normal in the beginning. Airport surveillance video captured the plane taxiing out, making several left and right turns with no apparent problems. That's important because it tells us the steering and rudder seem to be working fine on the ground. The takeoff roll also looked normal. The airplane stayed on the center line, which again suggests the pilots had directional control at that stage. But immediately after rotation, right as the airplane lifted off, things went sideways, literally. The aircraft suddenly yawed to the left and started entering a continuous series of left-hand turns. ADS-B data, which is essentially GPS-based flight tracking, shows that after takeoff, the plane drifted left made a 180 degree turn, and then went into eight full 360 degree circles. Nine circles in total. That's not a coincidence or sloppy flying. That's the airplane locked into a pattern it couldn't get out of. Witnesses on the ground recorded videos showing the plane at a low altitude, circling with its nose canted left, both engines clearly running. And that's another critical detail. This wasn't an engine failure event. The engines were producing power the whole time. Finally, after about 10 minutes of struggling, the aircraft clipped trees in a median, hit a road, and came apart across some railroad tracks. The wreckage was consumed by fire, leaving very little intact. The NTSB's preliminary report gives us the first real look at what they found in that wreckage. First off, investigators confirmed that all the major components of the aircraft, the wings, tail, fuselage, and engines, were accounted for at the site. Nothing fell off in flight, and that rules out something like a control surface separation before impact. Now let's talk about the rudder system, because this is where things get really interesting. The rudder is what controls yaw, the left and right movement of the airplane's nose. The right rudder cable was continuous all the way from the pedals in the cockpit back to the rudder bell crank, which is basically a pivoting lever that translates cable movement into rudder movement. However, the attach bracket that connected the cable to the bell crank had broken off. Investigators noted there was no fretting. Fretting is a kind of wear you'd expect if something had been loosening or rubbing over time. The fact that it wasn't there strongly suggests the break happened during the crash, not before. The left rudder cable told a similar story. It had fractured near both the pedals and the bell crank, but the ends were splayed out like a broom. What investigators call a broom straw appearance. That's classic tension overload, meaning the cable snapped from the extreme forces of the crash, not because it failed in flight. In plain English, the rudder control system was still intact and connected when the airplane was flying. But then comes the kicker, the trim system. For those who don't fly, the trim tabs are small adjustable surfaces on the control surfaces that let you fine tune the airplane's attitude so you don't have to hold constant pressure on the controls. Think of it as cruise control for keeping the plane straight and level. In this case, Investigators found the rudder trim actuator, the device that sets how much the trim tab is deflected, extended to a position that equals full left rudder trim. To put numbers on it, the actuator measured 1.5 inches of extension, which corresponds to about 21 degrees of trailing edge right deflection on the trim tab. And trailing edge right on the trim tab equals the rudder itself going full left. That's a huge discovery, because if the rudder trim was misset to full left, it could explain why the plane kept yawing left and why the pilots couldn't straighten it out. Other trim findings added to the puzzle. The elevator trim was set to about 11 degrees down, and the aileron trim was found full right. That combination suggests the pilots were fighting hard to correct the left yaw with every other trim system they had, but they never got the rudder trim back to neutral. 
And finally, the engines. Both engines were recovered with heavy impact damage, but internal inspections showed normal combustion signatures. The propellers had classic torsional twisting and S-bending, both indicators that the engines were making power at the time of impact. So again, this was not an engine failure crash. It was a control problem. The real centerpiece of this preliminary report is that rudder trim finding. Investigators measured the actuator and confirmed it was sitting at a position that equates to full left rudder trim. That's not a subtle setting, that's the extreme end of the scale. Now, how it ended up there is still a mystery, but two possibilities make sense at this stage. One is maintenance oversight. During an annual inspection, mechanics have to run all the controls and trim tabs through their full range of motion. It's part of the process to check cable tension, lubrication, pulleys, and so on. If the rudder trim was left deflected and not returned to neutral, and the pilot didn't catch it, the airplane could take off with full trim dialed in. The second possibility is pilot oversight. The Cessna 310's checklist specifically calls for trim to be set properly before takeoff. The rudder trim wheel, though, is located low down by the throttle quadrant. It's not as prominent as the elevator trim wheel, and it's surprisingly easy to overlook if you're rushing or distracted. And here's what's extremely frustrating. Based on what was found in the wreckage, it looks like the pilots may have been working hard with the other trims, aileron and elevator, but never got the rudder trim back toward neutral. Now it's really important to underline this point. We can't call this the cause. The NTSB has not ruled out whether this was a mechanics mistake, a missed pre-flight item, or something else entirely, but the trim position is the one thing in the prelim report that jumps out like a flashing red light. And this ties into a much bigger discussion, the risk of flying right after maintenance. The FAA and the NTSB have both published safety alerts, like SA041, warning that accidents often happen on those very first flights after annuals, especially when flight controls have been disturbed. Sometimes cables are misrigged, sometimes trim systems aren't reset, and in rare cases entire controls are hooked up backwards. So what's the takeaway here for pilots? The best practices are pretty clear. Before you even start the engines, verify that every trim tab is set to the proper position. Don't just glance, actually move them and confirm the indicator lines up, then during run-up, run the controls through their full range of motion. You're not just looking for smooth movement, you're also making sure nothing feels restricted, nothing feels asymmetric. And here's the one thing I always emphasize, Treat that first flight after heavy maintenance as a test hop, not a family trip. Go up solo or take the mechanic along and keep it local. Many aviation groups, AOPA, the FAA, and even magazines like Flying, strongly encourage this mindset. And this accident, respectfully, is a sobering reminder of why. A single overlooked detail can cascade into a situation that's almost impossible to recover from once you're airborne. There's another angle worth talking about here, crew resource management. Both Robert and Stephen Stark were licensed pilots. With two qualified people in the cockpit, there's an opportunity for cross-checking. Could one have been flying while the other scanned for a trim misset? Could a call-out or division of duties have helped catch the problem earlier? We don't know yet, but it's a valuable discussion for any two-pilot cockpit. Another point is the role of modern avionics. Some newer autopilot systems like the Garmin GFC 600 with smart rudder bias, can automatically apply rudder inputs if one engine fails. But here's the kicker. They don't do anything if the problem is a trim tab left in the wrong position. Technology can help, but it can't replace basic discipline in pre-flight checks. And finally, it's not like this is unheard of. Other Cessna twin investigations have specifically recommended that pilots emphasize trim verification during pre-flight, because there have been accidents where trim miss settings caused serious control problems. So when you combine that history with what's been found so far in this prelim, it makes sense why the investigators are zooming in on the trim system. At the end of the day, this was a heartbreaking accident. A family lost three generations in a matter of minutes, and the entire community was shaken. The preliminary report gives us some clues, especially around the rudder trim, but the final report is still down the road. For now, the best we can do is learn and apply the lessons. Respect post-maintenance flights, verify trim settings, and never 
underestimate how small details can have massive consequences. So, I want to hear from you. What steps do you take after maintenance to make sure every control and trim system is exactly where it should be? Drop your thoughts in the comments, because this is the kind of conversation that helps us all become safer pilots. And of course, I'll be following this investigation closely and will bring you updates when the final NTSB report is released.